Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. We live in a day where communication is somewhat unprecedented. We have so many different means and ways by which we can send some kind of message to get to our intended recipient. How frustrating, difficult, and, and I don't know, just very sad when communication is challenged or broken. It was just about seven years ago that, that we took another, in a sense, medical leap forward regarding the means of communication. There was a little boy named Grayson Clamp, and Grayson was born with deformities that didn't allow him to process hearing and the different means by which people are typically able to have hearing restored were unsuccessful with Grayson. And so some experimental plans were put in place and doctors actually inserted a man-made auditory nerve that went from his ear to his brain. And at three years of age, everything was finally put in place and in a sense, the equipment turned on. And then millions since have watched the video of a little three-year-old boy who has at that point never heard a human voice hear his father say for the first time the words, I love you. And to watch the expression on his face because communication is taking place is just priceless. And I'm certain not only were there a lot of smiles on people's faces as they watched it unfold, but tears filling people's eyes because voice matters to us. Communication is significant, meaningful. And mankind's always found ways to communicate. I mean, I mean, even you in your day, you may have had some special code when you were in elementary school to communicate a message from one person to the next. People in times of distress have come up with ways to send signals, to get a message from one person to the next. Even a whisper means something. I have had the privilege numbers of times to stand in what I think is somewhat of a sacred spot, physically a, a, a special, almost sacred spot where two people are declaring their love and fidelity each to the other till death do they part. And they usually are standing in front of me and there is something that's taking place and maybe there's a special, some music or, or a vocal solo that is happening and, and I'm standing there and and uh, they begin to look at each other and oftentimes hands are, are somewhat shaky and nerves are there. They're, they're contemplating the covenant they're about to make and, and all the significance that that means. And then as I'm just standing there, a, a fortunate participant, just a, a, an observer, and almost at that moment, the, the fly on the wall, someone just with a whisper will say, I love you. And just those words, that ability to communicate from one person to the next. And sometimes those words, just those words, the other person, you just see tears start to fill their eyes and stream down their face because one person communicated a very special message and it was received by the other. I mean, you think about a person whose name comes up on your phone. Oh, I know it doesn't happen with every name. <laughs> Sometimes you just act like, I didn't see that right then. But there are other names that come up on your phone and you have some ability right then to see like, oh, so-and-so is calling. And, and have you ever had it where you can't get to your phone fast enough? And because of the excitement of who's actually calling you and you start to, to jumble your phone a little bit. I remember the first time that, that a guy that I knew as Patch the Pirate, Ron Hamilton, called me on my phone. 
Ron Hamilton calling. I'm like, it's past the pirate, you know, and maybe I'm gonna go on the Jolly Roger. I just couldn't wait. It was so exciting that he called a, a message. Have you ever sent a message to someone before and, and you couldn't wait for them to respond? And, and now on some messaging systems, you can actually tell if they're typing. And so you send a message and then you can see, oh, they're, they're sending something back. And you wait. Have you ever sent a message and then you're just waiting for a response? Hello? Hello? Question mark, question mark. Because you want a response. There's something about prayer that is both initiated and then responsive. Paul begins the verse we're going to look at today with these words, and this I pray. Do you know what it says? It says, I am having a conversation with God. And he's about to let us in on what that conversation sounds like. And this I pray. God, these are matters of which I find important and I am talking to you. Do you remember the old song? We used to sing it years ago, whisper a prayer in the morning, whisper a prayer at noon, whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune. I'll tell you, God does more than whisper, although he does it continually. He whispers his love. He whispers this voice of reassurance. He, he whispers, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna have your provision. But I'm telling you, there are also times when God just shouts his love. And I can't help but think that, that God is so pleased when, when someone like the Apostle Paul or someone like Jeff Redlin or someone like you just says, God, you whisper a prayer, I love you. Uh, these are the needs. Lord, I know this person and this is what's going on. This I pray. And the Apostle Paul gives us this little insight into here is what I'm doing. I'm talking to God about you. And then he goes even further and he says, let me tell you exactly what I am praying. These are not arbitrary. They're not meaningless. They're not empty prayers. Years ago, one of the, 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 in fact, the second pastor of Campus Church, Dr. Jim Shetler, used to give a little simple outline regarding prayer. And he said, prayer should not be hazy, it should not be lazy, and it should not be crazy. And you know, the Apostle Paul says, okay, I'm going to give you something, and these are not lazy prayers. This is not a prayer such as this. And, and forgive, the, forgive the indicator here, but it's not a prayer that says, Lord, be with the church at Philippi. Remember, God's already promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So he's not saying something that God's already answered. I mean, can you, if God were to make a face, how would God respond visually if he is being asked something that he's already, he's already doing at that very moment? So, so Paul's not saying, Lord, just be with them. He's not saying in some really grand generic sense, Lord, um, would, you, would you just bless the church? I think you can pray for blessing, but, but shouldn't we be more specific and say, Lord, would you bless them with good health? Would you bless them with an accurate diagnosis? Would you bless them with the reminder of your presence? Would you bless them with the comfort of, of the warmth of your presence? I think we can be more specific with our prayers. Here is what he is about to do. He says, this is, a, this is what I'm praying. And then he's going to unfold two things that almost seem somewhat contradictory. He's going to say, I'm praying for you that you will have limitless love. And I am praying that your love would know its limits. Now, I know it seems contradictory, but it is not. Let's start with the first Paul's prayer for the church at Philippi and, and consequently his prayer, the, the prayer of the Holy Spirit for you and for me. He's saying first that you would love without limits. Look at Philippians chapter one, verse number nine. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Let's begin with that they would love 
without limits. He says this expression again. He says that your love may abound yet more and more. Okay, the first thing that Paul does is he does this. He says, I'm, I'm recognizing you have love. He says, okay, and that your love, I know you have it. And by the way, Paul had been the specific recipient of that love, the expressions of that love. I, I believe this wholeheartedly. I have watched it recently. I have watched it time and again. I've been the recipient of it. I've seen it poured out on others. I so thoroughly believe that Campus Church has love. Now that can only be the reality if it's, if it's present in its individual members. And then as we gather collectively and as we disperse to show that love as individual members of this collected body, people can see, wow, that's a church that loves. I I've seen it, by the way. I've seen it in the way that you have given financially. And I want to take a moment to just say I recognize it. I believe a church has two primary reasons for which it gives. It gives to its first responsibility, and that is the church. So sometimes people m confuse or misconstrue their responsibility or think that something is bigger than. Like some people say, well, I, I give to missions first. Well, well, that's fine. But your first responsibility, I believe, biblically speaking, is the local body. Missions doesn't exist outside the local body. So if the church disappears, so does missions. So people at Campus Church, through challenging times, have said, we're going to faithfully give. And I, as, as a pastor, am grateful. And beyond, not just that first responsibility, let me figure out a way today to give. Then they have given beyond that. Like, okay, these are additional opportunities. Paul was the recipient of that. The church at Philippi had needs. They met those needs. But then they also said, we're going to give to you out of our necessity. We have needs. God, we're going to trust that you meet those needs because we see a need here. And so they gave. Paul was the recipient of the expressions of their love. So he knew that they had love. But he makes a prayer regarding what they had. And here's what he says. He says, okay, I am praying now that your love would abound. It's not just this love that like, okay, yeah, I have, I have love that fits my heart. God says, no, 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 that's not what I want for you. I want your love to not be able to be contained by your heart. I want your love to actually overflow your heart so that it's there. But man, I just can't hold it. It actually overflows. And then... To add some, some even greater dynamic to this abounding love. Like, wow, that's a lot of love. Then the Apostle Paul says, I want your love to abound. And then he says, more. Okay, so now you have this big overflow of love. And then he says, now, now let's add to that and let's do more. And then it's not just an English translation. This is what he's saying. He says it in the Greek. He says, and more. <laughs> so I have abounding love. There's a lot of love that's overflowing. I can't contain it. And then there's more love. And then take that times two. And then there's even more. Do you get the idea that a watching world would see a church that is unusual in its capacity to love? That there is something that is supernatural. This is not the product of a person who is just by nature a loving person. This is a person who has love. Yeah, they have it. That love abounds and that love abounds more and even more. Instead of this staying some constant, there is something that is actually growing. And I would submit that love can't stay as a constant. It can't just say, well, I'm satisfied with my level of love. I don't believe that that's possible. In fact, there, there is a... Uh, there's a professor from Missouri State University, Sibel Mitra, and they were speaking about the second law of thermodynamics. They said this at a very microscopic level, this law, the, the second law of thermodynamics, simply says that if you have a system that is isolated, any natural process in that system progresses in the direction of increasing disorder or entropy of the system. Well, here's what he's saying. First of all, there's the danger of isolation. 
So any, any system of energy that is isolated is in pretty significant risk. I think that's one of the reasons why God called for the church to assemble, physically assemble. So God calls us together not to be isolated believers. So he calls us together, and then he says, now be careful, even, even the way God built the world, God's the one who put these things in place. He understands there are some implications of, of things like the, the second law of thermodynamics for people like you and me. There is something about me that unless it's actually stirred up, it tends to reduce some entropy, some, some disorganization, some, some receding of that which is supposed to be growing. I find that my love oftentimes needs the embers, so to speak, stirred up and some more fuel put on the fire to stoke the embers into a flame once again. And the Apostle Paul is helping us. In fact, the Holy Spirit all throughout Scripture says it is things like love for God and his word. Lord, I am going to look in your word because I need my own heart stirred up. I want love for each other. Lord, I have to have this growing, not a static, this is how I love. A love for the assembled body of believers, a love for the lost. Lord, I want a love for the weak, the weary, for those that are wounded. I want to love even for my enemies. This is the kind of love that God's offering for us to have. He says it in ways that are counterintuitive to us today. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, love your neighbor, the person you get along with, but hate your enemy. That's how the world works. But Jesus said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5, 46, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? He's saying, doesn't, doesn't a person that you have very little regard for, a publican, don't they do that? He's saying you are supposed to love in a way that is supernaturally infused, a way that you could not naturally accomplish. Of course, when we love those that are enemies, we are, we're doing what God's called us to do. And, and, and obviously, that means we're to love the body, the, the, the believers that are assembled. In John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, I'm telling you something new. Not just that you love one another, you love one another in the manner with which my self-sacrificing love has also loved you. Then we have to ask then, to what degree do I love? This is the kind of love that originates from God, who himself is limitless. In one way, we could say this love knows no degree. It is limitless, abounding, more and more love. A.W. Tozer is one of those um, wonderful writers of days gone by. Tozer wrote, and oftentimes he would either introduce a chapter or he would conclude a chapter with a prayer. In his book titled, The Knowledge of the Holy, he took different characteristics and attributes of God, and then he began to just expound on them. Listen to the prayer that Tozer connected to his chapter on the love of God. Tozer wrote, Our Father which art in heaven, we thy children are often troubled in mind. We are sure that there is nothing that could attract the love of one as holy and as just as thou art. Yet thou hast declared thine unchanging love for us in Christ Jesus. If nothing in us can win thy love, nothing in the universe can prevent thee from loving us. Thy love is uncaused and undeserved. 
Thou art thyself the reason for the love wherewith we are loved. Help us to believe the intensity, the eternity of the love that has found us. Then love will cast out fear and our troubled hearts will be at peace, trusting not in what we are, but in what thou hast declared thyself to be. Amen. This is the limitless love. It's what the Bible calls agape love. It's the love that is poured out upon us. It's love that abounds more and more. But with this love, this love that we're to say, Lord, help my life to be that kind of vessel that love overflows and then it does so more and more. Lord, this limitless love, help it to be rightly limited. And you say, how can you have limitless love that is limited? Well, I think the Holy Spirit explains it to us in verse number nine. So let's look at it again. Verse number nine. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Okay, boundaries are for... They're always in games. If you have a game, you have some boundaries. And certainly that's especially true in sports. So if you go out of bounds, then um, you stop play because you don't get to function out of bounds. You have to stay in bounds to play the game. Some time ago, I, I like enjoy watching uh, professional tennis. And I was watching a tennis player and um, the ball was thrown up and came down with the racket to serve and the lines person hollered out fault. Well, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a fault of the ball going out of the, the service court. It was a fault of their foot touching the service line. And when that happened, they just exploded at the lines person because, because they, they disagreed with the call. Now, it's hard to disagree in HDTV today. I mean, you can see every little thing. And so they zoom in and you watch the foot come down clearly on the line. They were absolutely out of bounds, but they went over to the lines person. And I'm telling you, they're shouting at the lines person. They got a, a racket in their hand. I thought they're gonna take their head off, you know? And, and it was pretty intense because they didn't like the fact that they were out of bounds. Listen, if you wanna play the game, you have to play the game in bounds. Now, Today, we talk a lot about love, as does God. We like to say things like, well, God is love. True, but God always loves in ways that are consistent with himself. And what Paul is about to say to the church, love, love with abounding, overflowing love, and then multiply that times two, love more and more. Love in a limitless way but love limited by two things. He says, this is what you're to be loving like, or these are the boundaries of your love. He says, I want you to love with these two things as the guardrails for your love. He says, let knowledge and judgment be the guardrails for the manner with which you love. If you'll let those two things be your guardrails, you can love in a limitless way, abounding love, abounding love more, abounding love more and more, but not out of bounds. There is a limit to which you are allowed to love and they are knowledge and judgment. So we start to think about these two things, knowledge. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18 says it this way, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. G.K. Chesterton said it this way. Chesterton said, love is not blind. Now, you've heard the expression, well, love is blind. Chesterton said, no, love is not blind. Love is bound. And the more it is bound, the less it is blind. What's he saying? Well, our love is supposed to be bound by knowledge and by judgment. What we mean by the word judgment is what we might refer to as discernment. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So he says, okay, knowledge, judgment, discernment. He says, let these be that which is 
binding your love. And the more you have knowledge, the more you can love and the more you will love in a manner that is not blind, but bound to knowledge. Sometimes we just know, well, what the world needs now is love. What the world needs now is the right kind of love. And that is very different from the way that the world oftentimes tries to define it. What does the Bible say about the unborn? What does it say about our bodies? What does the Bible say about the world? Or about how husbands are to love their wives? Or about how we are to love one another? What does it say about marriage, about money, about a whole host of matters that pertain to our lives? The more we know about the word, the more we know how to appropriately love. And then love is not blind then, it's just bound to truth. Remember, we can love someone with unconditional love. However, that is never meant to say that we give unconditional approval. Now, do you know what the world wants from us today? The world wants to say, hey, you Christians, you have to love us. And you know, they're right about that. But many times what they mean by it is you have to approve of us. And that's not what the Bible says. You know, sometimes we say love the sinner, but hate the sin. I know it becomes trite, but that is the truth of what scripture is unfolding for us. Let me ask you this. When did Christ love you? While we were yet sinners, if the greatest of love, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And while we were yet sinners, that word means when I was an enemy of almighty God, when I am defiant towards him, when I am hostile towards him, at that moment, he loves me with the greatest amount of love. So what does that mean for me and the world? It means that I can love someone who is living in sin, but I cannot give approval to the lifestyle that provides for the same. In fact, it means that because I love you, I have to tell you, I cannot approve of your sin. That doesn't diminish my love for you. I love you with a love that's supposed to be abounding, overflowing love. I love you with an abounding love that's more. And then beyond that, it's even more. But I can't approve of your lifestyle. This is where judgment comes in. The idea of discernment. It's the only time in the New Testament that this specific Greek word is used. It carries the idea of moral discernment. Typically, we understand judgment or discernment to mean what a judge would do on a bench. A judge sits on a bench and he is supposed to judge the matter that's before him. What that means is I'm trying to separate truth from error. What's right here and what's wrong here and how do I separate the two? Discern between right and wrong. Do you know love should discern? The, these are the boundaries. Do you remember when you were a kid and you went to an amusement park and you got in one of those little cars and um, you're driving the car through the track and there's some little guard thing that keeps it from going off too far. Did you ever try to jump the guardrail when you were a kid? Like, oh, and you run into it and you're trying to jump the track. Well, they're built pretty good. In fact, you have greater freedom to, to maneuver that car if you stay within the guardrails. And Christianity is such that there are these guardrails that God put up for our love because we're supposed to be known as people that love. But he put up these guardrails and he said, okay, knowledge, know the difference, know me, learn of me and judge. Separate truth from error, discern right from wrong, discern, choose good over evil, truth from lies. We often use the, the word love in ways that bring confusion. For example, you, you might know that I, I say many times, I love rhubarb. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you like rhubarb. What else does it mean? It means you're strained. Okay, it might mean a lot of things, but I, I love Mustangs. But let me ask you this. Have I ever taken the steps necessary to secure a Mustang? 
No, I just, I have some admiration for her. I love Gatlinburg, Tennessee, but, but I've never moved there to live there. I just like, oh, I, I love that. Sometimes we use the word love in ways that it just really, I, I love a good pepperoni pizza, but what does that really mean? What God is saying is your love is supposed to be actionable. It's not just some fuzzy feeling. Your love is supposed to do something and it is supposed to be guarded by knowledge and judgment. Sometimes again, we say, well, all we need is love. The Bible says it this way. In John 14, verse 15, he says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, then start to take the truth, the knowledge of truth, the ability to discern right from wrong and put it into practice. Start to do. This is a motivating, actionable love. It is love that moves us beyond admiration to action. It is love that separates that which is wrong and holds fast to that which is right. It is love that cares enough about another to actually correct them and speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. This is not a feelings motivated love, but a love that transcends our feelings. As we looked at last week, it doesn't ignore our emotions, but it's not directed by them either. In 1 John 3, 11, the Bible says, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And as we grow in knowledge and in discernment, it stands to reason that we grow in the way we can love each other. This means that I cannot approve of any love based on my knowledge of scripture that goes out of bounds. That's not true love. What does that mean? It means things like this. While I cannot deny that two men or two women may love each other with sincere affection or desire for one another or physical desire one for another. Based on an accurate knowledge of scripture, I cannot approve of it. I can love them. I can love them with a love that abounds, a love that overflows, a love that's more and more, but I cannot approve. When two people say that a physical relationship, irregardless of gender, outside of marriage, is simply an expression of their love. And it is what everybody today does. Then we cannot approve based on the knowledge of scripture and after discerning that which is right from that which is not. Things like adultery are often today given open approval under the false guise of we were in love. Sadly, we often say something like, well, they love each other with some resignation that this must be the thing about which nothing else can be said. End of discussion. Instead, we must evaluate this based on truth and the teaching of the word of God. There are boundaries, limits to our love, and it is knowledge and discernment. The world that the Philippians were living in was not so unlike our world today. It was filled with abortion, adultery, promiscuity, pornography, greed, rebellion, every other kind of sin with which we are all too familiar today. And it was actually celebrated much like it is today. Paul is praying with every fiber of his being for those that are the object of his affectionate love. He says, love lavishly, love abundantly, love with an excessive overflow of love. Love in a way that is only bound by the limits of God. He's limitless in his love. He says, but with that limitless love, let it be limited by knowledge and discernment. She wrote words years ago that are timely for this passage of scripture. Her name is Elizabeth Prentice. She wrote, more love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. 
Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. The more you and I love Jesus Christ, the more we will rightly have an abounding love that is actually more and more limitless, limited by knowledge and discernment. By God's grace, may Campus Church love like God loves. Father, thank you for truths found in your word that sharpen us, mold, make, and conform us to an image that is far beyond our own. May there be something of you and your love always found in the assembly of believers here. May the world see something supernatural about the manner with which we love. Lord, help us to love like you love. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.